everyone. <clears throat> okay, so today is the lecture on the forces of evolution. Um, so just a little real quick. Um, Waffle, this one, uh, was I just picked her up from the vet. So she was at the vet earlier. She got her teeth cleaned, um, which I, you know, she gets done. Uh, look at the smiley one, right? <laughs> Uh, so she gets her teeth, you know, and if you're, if you have dogs, you know, like they have to put them under anesthesia to clean their teeth and stuff. Um, so she does that. I get that done for her fairly often, you know, the recommended time. But the reason I got it done now, instead of like the scheduled time, which would have been in a few months is so you, if you've been watching these videos, you notice like she has had like an allergy problem for the last like six months and she'll start getting really snotty and she's always like dripping snot. Um, she's almost 11 and she's never had allergies and I've lived here for like five years and it's never been a thing until like right around I was maybe like March or April I took her to the vet they're like oh it's allergies gave her medication didn't work and so it's been six months of us trying to figure out what's going on with her but they did a bunch of exams blood work she's normal her lungs are clear um it's just something here and so anyway so when they did the um teeth cleaning because she's under anesthesia they were able to put her uh, they, oh my god they were able to do x-rays so they did full head x-rays and then they did like this like you know nasal swab they're gonna find out what's going on but um i don't know so she's kind of like lethargic i just picked her up like an hour ago so she's like oh. and she's got a little if you notice a little wrap on her leg if she moves you'll probably see it's purple from where i think where they had like the like a little id for her but uh you know this one and i got to alice we got to hang out all day um, after I dropped Waffle off, I took Alice to Taco Bell and we got like hash browns and she, she loved it. So anyway, if you're like, what's, why is Waffle like not her usual, oh, she heard me say your name, you know, or if you notice the bandage on her, you'll be like, oh, that's why. Okay. But anyway, um, and, uh, back to, or let's start the, the PowerPoint. Okay. So the forces of evolution. <sighs> okay. So slide two, um, what is evolution? And I think I've showed you guys this before, but I have this tattooed on me, a change in allele frequency in a population over time. So this is the definition for biological evolution. Now you might be thinking, okay, I'm not really sure about some of those terms, um, but we, wait, no, yeah, in this class, we went over this already, like allele, we talked about Mendel, we talked about genes, we, we, we did all that. Yeah, because we did the genetics and inheritance. I'm asking you, first of all, you're not really there, I'm just asking myself. <laughs> Yes, we did that. Okay. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> okay, so for the meme, it is that simple. It's not some complicated thing. Now, of course, it can get very complicated in the processes and, and how we understand it. Like, it can be very complex and very beautiful. But the actual definition, what we're talking about in terms of the actual process, before we get into like all of you know the different things we're going to talk about today, it is just a change in allele frequency in a population over time, or you could say a change in genetic information in a population over time. That's all that it is. It's not controversial. It's not difficult to understand. It's a very simple thing. <clears throat> but to get into the point of this PowerPoint, the five forces. So there are five different ways that this change in, gel in allele. And only a frequency in a population over time can happen. There are five ways, and we're going to talk about those ways. Okay, so the next slide, slide three. So before we even get into the different forces, I want to point this out. This is so important. Put a star next to this or highlight it. Evolution, per the PowerPoint, evolution has no goal. There is no goal. There's no, like, the spirit of natural selection is out in the world, like, saying, you evolve, evolve, evolve. You evolve into that, you evolve into that. That's like, that's not how it's working at all. Um, there's no evolution towards getting faster or bigger or, or stronger, unless that's what's beneficial. Because as you can imagine, there are plenty of times where being smaller is beneficial, being slower is beneficial, being able to hide. Like, so it's not always about, I think we have this idea in our minds, like it's a very cultural thing, like bigger, better, faster. Like, that's not always the case depending on the environment, depending on what you eat, depending on if it, anything's eating you. Like, it can be very different, like a dog hair or something, like where is that? Okay. Um, there's no goal to evolution. There's not, because I think in our minds we think, like per this, this slide, we think, oh, like 
there's a goal towards being like human like that's completely false um, and that's just like not an opinion that's literally like that's not how it works there's no goal towards being bipedal there's no goal towards even having a big brain um, now we could clearly say be, having a big brain has clearly been a benefit to humans and other other ape species that is that is definitely true but look at all of the other species that, is, that exist now and have existed that have done perfectly well without that large brain or maybe a moderate sized brain or a really small brain like it just it depends on the environment it depends on that species um, there humans are we are unique and interesting in our own way just like any other species is unique and interesting in their own way we have that bias because we are human. So of course we think like, well, human, yeah, sure, you know, Alicia, but humans are kind of, but no, that's just our bias. If we were dogs, we'd probably think dogs are better. If we were rats, we would think rats are better. Um, that's a bias. Now you could say, okay, sure, maybe that's a bias, but look at all the things that humans can do. And I would say, it's not as if, I'm, I'm not saying humans aren't unique and interesting and special. Like that's absolutely true. Have we done things that very few other animals have done or can do? Yes, that's true, but we are not unique in that. Um, we aren't the only animals that make tools, either currently existing or have existed. We're not the only uh, species that, that have, has language, a complex form of spoken language. We're not the only ones. Um, so we're gonna get, as we get into the semester, we'll talk about all those different species. But even if we're just talking about the ones that exist now, if you look at apes, uh, other apes, um, chimpanzees, gorillas, um, we know that they have learned have been taught sign language, multiple examples of that. So they have the mental capability of understanding a complex symbolic thought. Um, and I don't know if it's in this PowerPoint or another one, we're gonna talk about, like there are clear ways that humans, we are better at certain things, but we are definitely not better at other things. There are so many things that we are really horrible at. Um, so like, for example, we are not very fast at all. Um, when you look at a lot of other, cause I think we have it in our minds like, oh, we're like the top, Predator, well, that's not even accurate. You know, we're not, well, we're not carnivores. We're, we're, if you technically want to, if you want to get technical, we're, we're only recently omnivores. Um, but also, like, if you think, if you compare this to other animals who we consider, like, at the top in some way, like, even in our biased interpretation of that, we're not very, we're not fast at all. Um, we, being on two, on hind limbs, two limbs, that's, we're not fast because of that. Now, but being bipedal gives us other advantages. We can go for very long distances without having to rest. Um, so then it's like, it's one of those things like in terms of like what the environment was, was it going to be beneficial to be able to go really fast or was it more beneficial to be go long distances? Hence, we probably came by, became bipedal because of that and, and some other factors. I'm getting way off topic. The point is, although, oh, what I was going to say is like humans, yes, if you look at us, but here's the thing, if you look at us as a group, because I hear this, well, like we have cell phones, like, <laughs> yeah, but you don't know how to, I mean, maybe one of my students, but like, I'm assuming, I mean, I don't, none of my friends do. We as, a, like, we as individuals don't know how to do those things. We depend on those things because we have a very rich cultural experience that we share all that information with each other. But we, that's not built into who we are as like an individual of our species. The only thing we can really say about being an individual of our species is that we're bipedal, we have big brains, we can understand you know, complex symbolic thought and expression. Um, and there's, a, there's some more things as well. But when it gets into a lot of these cultural things like inventions and technology, that's not something that we can say, like we can claim as a member of the species that we have intrinsically in us as individuals. That's not. Um, so there's no goal towards, like this is another thing I've heard, you know, when, are, when will chimpanzees evolve, evolve into humans? Like that's not how it works either. <sighs> chimpanzees will never evolve into humans. Now let's say we don't kill them off, they don't all die. Chimpanzees will continue to evolve in whichever way is most beneficial given their environment. That might mean they maybe become bipedal. Maybe their brains even get bigger, maybe not. But let's just say that happens. Let's say they become bipedal, like in a few hundred thousand years, a couple million years, chimpanzees are fully bipedal, walking on two limbs, and their brains are much larger, and they can speak in a similar way that we do. They wouldn't be human, they wouldn't be homo sapiens, they'd be pan something, something, like they'd be their own thing. There's no goal towards being bipedal it's not as if you're looking at like this picture, it's not as if, okay, like bugs are trying to become something that, and birds are, there's no, there's not trying to do anything. That's not, there's no goal. There's no like force behind it in that sense, like pushing it towards a specific thing. The only thing that's manipulating is what's happens to be, um, what the environment is and what, and what traits you have and what's most beneficial. And of course there's some other factors we're going to talk about, but there's no, there's no ultimate goal. Now, some have said, well, there's, maybe a goal 
like an evolutionary goal of going from like less complex to more complex. But then you get into like what, how do you define complexity? Um, it, like, do we have our own bias in that? Like my advisor always says, um, you know, bats are probably one of the most complex animals. Like they have echolocation. Um, we don't have that. So does that make them better? Like when you start getting into like better or worse or more complex or like, like it, it you want to avoid it in terms of like something like that, like I'm pointing, like you can see, like in terms of like the slide on the PowerPoint, like in terms of like a hierarchy, it's not that way. It's definitely more like a tree. We're gonna see animals continue to evolve in different directions, depending on the environments and depending what traits they have in their genetic, you know, in their gene pool. Okay, so hopefully my rant made sense to you and hopefully it'll become more clear as we go through these. Okay, slide four. So I just said all this, right? No hierarchy, there's no goal. Um, but you don't, you should have a, there's no value judgment in nature. Like, oh, we need to be working towards this one thing because that's the best. Because that's not how it works. That's not, that's not how any of it works. It's really just what's the given environment, what traits happen to be available, which ones are most beneficial, you know, in contrast to others. And that's what's gonna be, what's gonna continue. And if the environment changes, then what's beneficial, what traits are beneficial will also change. Um, all right, like I said, no animals are trying to become humans. Um, that's not like how it works. Okay, slide five. This is so true. Like literally, per my rant right now. <laughs> okay, um, but these are the five forces of evolution. We're gonna talk about each of these. Natural selection, mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and non-random meeting. So we're gonna talk about those. Okay, so the first one, natural selection. So we talked about this before when we talked about Darwin and, and the who's who and the, the thinkers before him and then his idea, Darwinian evolution, AKA natural selection. So we talked about that. But just as a recap, you can see, do I have that one? Um, so just, just to reiterate what I told you guys before on that, um, Darwin, you know, in his travels and in his research noticed you know, some really important things. Nature is not this romantic, ideal that a lot of people have thought. It's not beautiful and peaceful in that balance. It is, there is competition. It is violent. It is chaotic. There, there is competition for resources, whether it's, you know, water or food or uh, like plant food or animal food, whether it's mates, there's always competition. Sometimes that competition is increased or decreased depending on, you know, the availability and the given environment, but there's always going to be that competition. Um, certain traits, depending on the environment, are going to be more beneficial than other traits. And because those individuals will have an advantage, they are more likely to survive and then more likely to reproduce successfully. And then over time, you will see a transition to more individuals having those traits than the other traits. That's natural selection. It's a very simple thing to understand. Slide seven, Herbert Spencer. Um, oh yeah, okay, so survival of the fittest. So you might've heard this phrase before. Whenever I've heard this phrase, it's often used incorrectly. It does not mean survival of the strongest or the fastest. Now, like we have the term fit, like we use like in common conversation, like that person's really fit. Typically we think like they're really athletic or they're really strong. That's not what it means. Survival of the fittest does not mean survival of the strongest or the fastest. Like I already said, it can be really beneficial to be slow or small. Um, it's a reference to an evolutionary concept called fitness and simplified fitness is the number of offspring you have. So I have zero offspring. If any of you, like if you have one offspring or two, you are more fit than I am. You are more evolutionary fit, evolutionarily fit than I am because you, are, you have already passed your genetic information into the next generation. So survival of the fittest literally just means survival of the people with the most offspring, bec literally because more of their genes are surviving into the next generation. If I don't have any offspring, none of my genes are going, at least none of my direct genes. Um, if you have offspring, then your genes are now gonna survive into the next generation. Okay, slide eight. This is an important concept in natural selection. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You may have heard this expression in other contexts, but this is absolutely true. Natural selection is never about this optimal state of perfection in some way or getting to this peak adaptation, whether it, you know, physical or behavioral, whatever it is. It is just about being a little better than the other thing that was happening before. Like what gives you a little bit more of an advantage? Um, because whatever, the thing that you're doing now, maybe it's a little better than the other thing, doesn't mean this thing's great. It just means it's a little better than the other thing. So this phrase, you don't have to be faster than the bear, you just have to be faster than the person next to you. 
that's the point. Like in natural selection, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be the best. Sometimes you'll see states where you're like, oh, that's actually like pretty, you know, a little more optimal state than you would expect or maybe a little less. But in general, that's just not how it works. It's gonna just always be a little bit better than the other thing. So like, as an example, bipedalism. So humans, you know, around six million years ago, our, the human lineage started to transition to walking on two limbs versus walking on four. This was really beneficial for probably a number of reasons. And I think we talk about that in like another PowerPoint, like the specifics of that. Um, however, even though it might've been better then and now to be bipedal rather than quadrupedal for a number of reasons, it doesn't mean that being bipedal is without complications. So think about all of the problems we have because we're putting all of our body weight on two limbs now instead of just, instead of four. Most people have some kind of, you know, back problem, hip problem, knee problem, foot problem. It's because all of our body weight is now on two limbs. Um, we've only had a few million years to adjust. Now, if we had more time, we might see a little improvement in that. But also, we could in a million years be all gone. We could be adapted in some other way. Maybe the world will be flooded and people who have a mutation for webbed feet are the most common, like we don't know, you know. Um, so just think of it that way. There's never an optimal prime state where we see, oh, you know, everyone's adapted to the per perfection. Now you might be really well adapted, and we see this, this is literally how it works in nature. You see animals being very specifically adapted to their environment, but it's not as if that adaptation is without a problem. Because natural selection can only work with what it has. So like we were, um, let me think example if you know like like for example like my dog so like she has you know like say medium length hair if natural selection could say okay let's make the hair thicker for you know uh, if it gets really cold or longer or maybe even the color might change like over generations like that it can work with our kind of already there and sometimes you have mutations that can you know make drastic jumps but it can't make these crazy like well let's just make this dog um, six foot tall and by like over the course of a couple of generations, it's not gonna happen because that thing might be the best option. Like it's, it can only really work with what's available genetically. It can alter it sometimes in, in really complex ways, but it can only really work with what's there. And sometimes what's there is, you know, like average um, or just enough and that's what you get. So like I said, bipedalism is a really good example. Like it was beneficial at the time, it still is, um, but it's not as if it's not without any issues. It's not some perfect state of being, you know, it's just a little better than what was before, given our population's, you know, specific environment and 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 um, um, behaviors and. Okay, hopefully this is all making sense to you guys. Okay, slide nine, and just some more examples. I think I gave you guys some of these examples before with natural selection. So, but here's just a few more. You can see like these animals have adapted with coloring. So if at least you, maybe you can't even see like the moth. There's like a black moth against the, the darker uh, bark on the tree. The desert hare has the, you know, the browns blend in and also has longer limbs. Remember Bergman's and Allen's rule, longer limbs to dissipate heat, um, longer, every, like longer ears too to dissipate that heat. The, the, the bunny in the snow, you know, fatter, probably a little more body fat, definitely thicker hair fur, the color. So these animals are really well adapted to their environments. Um, was I gonna say? But if their environment changes, like suddenly if like the, the where the desert hare is living, if, if, if it becomes very snowy, he might not, or she might not do as well. Um, if they didn't, you know, maybe if they had a little bit lighter, like the snow bunny, then it would be better. So it's always a, the interact, sorry, the hiccups. It's always the interaction of the traits and the environment together. Okay. And then, so here's another example. Oh, slide 10. Um, so you can see there's a population of bugs, some green and some orange. The, the their natural predator, the spurred, you know, loves the green ones. Maybe they taste better and is eating all the green ones. Like, yeah, I'm our favorite, the green beetles. Um, so over time, the green beetles are not surviving, which means they're probably not reproducing. Maybe they're, they're getting eaten before they even reproduce. So the orange ones are like, well, we are surviving and reproducing all these, you know, offspring. And so over time, what you're gonna see is this transition in that population from, you know, maybe 50 50 green and orange to like mostly orange that's natural selection that that's it that's it right there sometimes it's maybe it's not a natural predator it could be a, an env environmental factor it could be like the weather it could be you know it could be terrain it could be a predator it could be the food that they're eating or a combination of all of those things okay slide 
slide 11, <sighs> mutation. So this is another way. So we talked about natural selection. That's one way we can get a change in allele frequency in a population over time. Mutation is another way. So this can just happen. Like, so we talked before about those processes of, um, why are blanking? Mitosis and meiosis. There are plenty of times during those processes where things can go wrong um, at the, you know, at the DNA level, like at the base pair level, at the, at the, at the gene level, at the chromosomal level. And when this happens, it's a mutation. Sometimes a lot of times, like everyone has a mutation. Um, most of the time they're not noticeable because they're just like, they're not showing on you phenotypically, you know, if it's just like a base pair change or something. Um, so they're neutral. They don't really give you an advantage, but they're not really detrimental to you either. You can have some that are detrimental. Like you might, what if suddenly you have like two extra chromosomes or you're missing three chromosomes or something, you're like, probably just wouldn't form correctly and you, you, you know, um, it wouldn't be viable with life, but also it could be advantageous. So I, I, I gave that example a minute ago and there was that movie, um, water world where like the world's flooded. And, um, so like, what if that was the case, the world's flooded and you get a mutation for like webbed feet, you might have a big advantage in that world versus if you had it now, it probably wouldn't affect you too much either way. Um, but given the right environment, it could be, an advantage. Okay, so the next slide is slide 12. Gene flow. So this is a way you can get a change in allele frequency in a population over time just because some people decide to leave or other people decide to move in. So we're talking about a population, let's say Las Vegas, for example. Let's take, let's look at Las Vegas and imagine you're looking at all the genetic, the, like the, the gene pool of Las Vegas. Um, Let's say 20,000 people in Las Vegas decide to, or decide to leave. They want to move to California. And then we look at what's left. We compare that before they left, and then we look at what we currently have. That gene pool is going to be very different just because people left. It didn't have anything to do with natural selection. It didn't have anything to do with the mutation. It's just because if you're looking at that gene pool in that population as a group, some people left, suddenly that, that, the gene frequency, the illegal frequency is going to, going to shift because it's going to change. And the same thing in the opposite. Say we're looking at all of Las Vegas. Sorry. And let's say, you know, what, 20,000 people from California decide to move, next, move to Vegas next week. If we had the before and after, we'd say, okay, here's Vegas gene pool. Now we have 20,000 new people. The gene pool will be a bit different. That's all gene flow is. It's a change in the genetic information in that population just because people have, like, you know, moved in and out. That's it. The next one genetic drift. So imagine there's an island and um, let's say one day some people happen to be down at the beach. They're, you know, suntanny. Some people are on the hillside at the picnic and suddenly there's an earthquake in, you know, in the ocean and the tsunami comes and the people, let's say 95% of the people who were on the beach that day died because of that. Now, if just by chance, it just happened to be mostly, let's say like blonde people on the beach and mostly like redheads on the hillside, after that natural disaster, by chance, you're gonna have, you know, more redheads in the population because now the, the frequencies have changed in that population. Um, the same thing if you imagine like there's um, it's some kind of geographical barrier. Let's say that um, you know there's a population of frogs and a mountain range is forming or a river is forming and has separated maybe isolated one of those groups. That group now is isolated and the genetic information that is now in the population versus before will be different because of that. Um, simply because of this like natural event. So this is genetic drift. And you might end up seeing within that population, like the isolated population, certain um, traits be more prominent, not because they were necessarily like advantageous in terms of natural selection, but because that's all that was available by chance in that, in that population, if that makes sense. Okay. And then the last one, non-random mating. also known as sexual selection. Oh, I got a snoring dog in the background. I don't know if you can hear it. Okay. 
Um, basically what this means is it is not random why you are attracted to who you're attracted to. Um, oh man, she's really snoring. If I were to ask you all, like take five minutes and make a list, like the top 10 things you'd look for in a romantic partner, you might, now that's going to be different if you're like uh, heterosexual or homosexual. Um, everyone's probably going to have a list that includes, you know, certain physical traits, probably certain emotional traits, um, a probably list of like activities or hobbies they want their you know, romantic partner to also enjoy doing the way they do. So you might say like, oh, I want someone who's, you know, tall, um, who's really into, you know, baseball and who is a really good communicator. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like everyone would have a list and it would be, it'd probably be very specific things. And our list, some of us would have some overlapping stuff because especially like if you look at like all heterosexual females or all heterosexual males because of evolution and, and you know like psychological adaptations for mate choice you're gonna see some general overlap that's absolutely true but we're gonna have some differences because it's also going to be informed by like our personal history like if you had a really bad experience with you know a guy you were dating you know a couple years ago who was tall and skinny and blonde you might not want to date someone who looks like that again so like that that's definitely true like our cultural experience and, and our you know personal experiences can definitely inform on that but the point of this is that a lot of these choices are very specific to an evolutionary process like we don't realize that that's what's happening like that's not at the forefront of our mind like oh yeah I'm thinking about hormone levels or like we're not thinking that but that's absolutely what's happening so I'm gonna give you guys some examples oh actually I was, I was wrong I let's be on the next PowerPoint okay never mind that's gonna be on the next one um, so there are two, so slide 15, there are two types, intra and intersexual selection. And that's right, because we are going to spend a lot of time talking about just this one alone, sexual selection. Um, so that's it for this one. But I, but the next one will be on sexual selection. We'll be talking about that. And it's probably one of my favorite ones. We talk favorite, favorite topics of this class. And it's quite long. I'm hoping to only split it into two parts, one and two before the exam. We should be able to, um, in class sometimes because people we have really great conversations we end up talking about it for like forever but I think with just me videoing it I can do it in two in two moderately long videos um, okay so that's it for today oh less than 30 minutes that's good okay so I'll see you guys on the next lecture